Hello, I am Brian Goulet of the Goulet Pen Company, and I am back, finally, shooting another video. It's the first one I've done in like two weeks, and I'm sorry. I know, I've kind of taken a while to get back in the swing of things. I just recently went on a family vacation uh, to Disney World, and I had a lot of fun there. Um, but before I get all into that, this is uh, Goulet Q&A, if you've never seen it before. It's a question and answer kind of thing. This week is just an open forum. You know, I was gone for a week, settling back into the swing of things here, so I just thought taking random questions would be good. I wouldn't have to theme it and try and do a big thing. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, this is the 24th one I've done here, which is pretty cool, uh, March 14th of 2014. Um, got a lot of really good questions this week. I'm really kind of excited. Uh, got a bunch of them. So I'm going to try to kind of, you know, move through them pretty good so I can cover as many as possible. I wasn't able to answer everything that came in, but uh, pretty much uh, a lot of the questions I have. So uh, I've been kind of light on the videos just the last couple of weeks, but I'm going to get in the swing of things here, and, and this video is going to kick it back off. So that'll be good. Um, one neat kind of thing, a couple of people made this connection, but we were at Disney World. We went there with Rachel's family. You know, my kids are two and four. They're a little on the young side. They were kind of freaked out by some of the characters, uh, but I did get some great pictures and video and stuff. Just, um, it was nice. This was the first vacation we've actually taken in, uh, you know, almost three years. So that's how it goes when you're self-employed and have young kids and stuff. But uh, it was nice to get away a little bit. And we actually got to get away. We didn't even take our computers, which for us was just crazy because, as many of you know, we're pretty plugged in around on here so um, got a great team here that was able to hold things down while we were gone even had a snow day and had to shut down and all our team just kind of went with the went with the flow and, and worked out really great so it's really awesome to have such a great crew here it makes me and Rachel's life a little easier um, but uh, some of you made the connection that um, the Grays of the Edison Pen Company they actually went to Disney World at the same time it was kind of coincidental we did talk to them ahead of time and kind of encourage them they, if they were thinking about a Disney World trip we had already had ours planned. We encourage them to go because their son is, you know, I think eight years old. So uh, that perfect age. And so they ended up going at the same time that we did. And as it turned out, because of some off some special deals and offerings and stuff, we actually ended up staying at the same hotel that they did. Now, granted, Disney hotels are massive and very spread out, but we were there at the same time. And so we met up for breakfast one morning and we ran into, e our families ran into each other, you know, on Main Street and Magic Kingdom them on one random day so it was, it was kind of neat just to, to be down there because we have a good working relationship with uh, Edison Pen Company and normally we only get to see them once a year uh, at the, the DC Pen Show uh, because we're like 10 hours from them so it's not exactly a quick drive to go see them but it was really neat to get to see them in person and kind of be out of the, the working element and get to see more personally so that was kind of neat. Uh, anyway, that's that's uh, some, just some background stuff, what I've been up to recently. Uh, so thanks for being so patient, you know, kind of getting the, the flow of the blog and everything back into the groove here. Um, but got a really good Q&A for you today, so lots of good questions. So that said, uh, I'll go ahead and kick it off. Um, first question I had was Andy S. on Facebook said, now that the 2014 Lamy Safari color is out, what are your thoughts on the color? Love it or hate it or relatively indifferent? Okay, so Fountain Pen Geeks came out with um, a post a couple days ago. Um, I actually knew about this color ahead of time, but as an official retailer, I have to kind of keep my mouth shut until Lamy says it's okay to talk about it. Well, FP Geeks kind of leaked it out. Uh, you know, they're not a retailer, so they can just, you know, post things whenever they find out. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's okay. But, you know, they were pretty down on the color. Um, it's, for those of you that don't know, it's neon coral. I can't officially talk about it now. I actually just got the word this morning that Lamy said it's okay to officially address it. So it's up on the uh, gulipens.com now. You can go ahead and sign up for an email notification. I don't know exactly when it's coming. I think it's going to be, you know, a month or two away. It's it's not like it's going to be here, you know, right away. But um, neon coral, so it's it's basically like a hot pink. Um, and I think the reason that FP Geese was down on a little bit is because, you know, they just had a pink pen that is is now discontinued again. It's actually the pink Lamy Safari has been released three times now. So it was here, you know, a couple years, like four or five years ago, and then it came out again a couple of years ago, and then it just recently came back about six or eight months ago, and then now it's, it's discontinued again, so I think they're gone from just about every retailer again. Um, and so this neon coral color, I think, appears to be really similar in color in the photos as it is uh, to the, the regular pink safari, or the what used to be regular and is now discontinued. I don't think they're gonna be that close in person. Yes, they're both pink, 
kind of. Um, I think the neon coral is going to be much more of a hot pink. Um, the neon, I can tell you, you know, last year's Lamy Safari color was the uh, neon yellow. And I can tell you that the way that that pen looks in a photograph versus the way it looks in person is completely different. Because when you have that kind of neon, almost fluorescent kind of color, you cannot really digitally reproduce that color very easily at all. It's just outside of the spectrum of what a, a monitor can display. I can tell you that from trying to photograph these things before uh, and trying to video you know, record the, the neon yellow. It just didn't come across the way it does in person. I haven't seen the neon coral myself yet, but I'm willing to bet it's the same kind of thing. I bet that thing is going to just explode in your face in person. Um, so that said, I can't make a judgment on it until I actually see the thing in person. And I'll do a video on it and everything when it comes out for sure. Uh, but that is my anticipation, is that this thing is going to appear very different in person to the, to the Lamy Pink. Now, personally, I probably would have gone with a different color. I've been dying for, to see a purple safari. I know a lot of you have been dying to see purple. Um, that's one that's really kind of missing out of their lineup. I keep encouraging Lamy to come out with that. You know, I don't have that much pull, you know, all the way up to the Lamy as a manufacturer. So, you know, maybe somebody high up will watch this video and, and listen to what I have to say, but I doubt it. Um, so, you know, it's just my opinion. I would love to see something like that. But I'm not down on the Neon Coral. I think it's a neat color. I think pink as a color is a really interesting pen color. Uh, I think it's, you know, there's been a trend in the last couple of years. I'm not that into fashion, but I think there's been a trend of, you know, neon brighter colors and stuff. You know, I'm a child of the 90s. You know, I, I, I was born in the 80s, but my formative years were in the 90s. And I remember having, you know, a lot of neon clothing uh, as a child. And so for me, you know, I did slap bracelets in that era. So I, I, you know, to me, it's like, okay, neon, you know, that's a thing. It's, it's not like my favorite color, but I can definitely see that a lot of people would be excited about that color. So I'm not going to be down on it. Uh, I'm, I tend to be relatively open-minded when it comes to my own opinions about new things that come out, just because I deal with so many different people and so many different customers and preferences and stuff like that. I know that even if there's something that it's not like, you know, making me go crazy, I know that a lot of other people may like it and I'm, I might be completely surprised about how many people love the neon coral so that said I'm pretty open-minded about it and I think that it will be a much cooler pen in person than it appears uh, on a computer screen okay mate F <clears throat> on Facebook said <clears throat> any chance of you carrying the lower-end pelicans like the m200 for example I mean it's a good company but I don't want to drop six hundred dollars on a pen I think you're referring to the like m600 800 m thousand uh, but I want to order from you guys. I know you could special order any Pelican, Pelican, but having a few of the cheaper ones in your warehouse might be a smart move. Um, yeah, we've, we've had that mentality before. We actually carried the M200, 205, and 215, the full line, uh, a couple of years ago with all the nib choices and everything. Um, the um, we, we don't carry it anymore. We dropped it a couple of years ago. We carried it for about a year or so, maybe a year and a half. And um, it was a lot of money to tie up because it's, it's still not, it's not a cheap pen. Um, and to carry all the different nib sizes and everything was, was a bit of an investment for us. Um, and at that time, they were selling okay, but not phenomenally. And at that time, we underwent a price increase on those pens and the sales dipped a lot. No, th that those M200s and stuff, they're available at a lot of different retailers, so we don't necessarily have a particular edge over carrying those that anyone else might necessarily, um, other than just kind of doing things the way we do them. But, you know, there's some stiff competition with Pelicans, um, especially the 200s, and they just weren't selling that well for us. So uh, we decided to drop them. Not too many people gave a big stink about it when we did, and we get asked about them from time to time, but I haven't seen like an overwhelming demand and reason to pick them back up again, other than the person who's kind of casually interested in seeing them every now and then. Uh, that said, they've undergone a price increase again since then. So now the prices for those M200s and stuff are in like the $165 range. And when you're doing that, you're getting in competition with gold nib pens like the Lamy 2000, the Pilot Vanishing Point, the Custom 74, the Namiki Falcon. Um, so it gets really tough to justify a steel nib pen like the M200, 215, stuff like that. They are good pens. I will say that. I had good experiences with them. The quality is very good. They're piston filling pens. I do like them. 
Um, but for me as a retailer, I have to be smart about how I stock things. You know, is there a demand for them and, and stuff like that? There's certainly that component of things as you can imagine running a business like this. Um, so that said, if there is an interest in them, I would certainly revisit it again. Um, I would be open to it. If I was to do it again, I would probably approach it in a more limited manner. I wouldn't go for the full line probably. I would just kind of selectively carry some things, limit some of the nib choices to some of the more popular things just to, you know, as a retailer, just to be a little bit smarter about how I do it and then expand if the demand is there. Um, so, you know, the one thing I do want to point out though is for doing special orders, um, we place orders with Pelican fairly regularly. So you're looking at a week or two probably as a delay for a special order and we don't charge a premium for that or anything. So if you are interested in shopping from us, combining it with another order, we'll hold your order and stuff like that. It's not a big deal. So um, you can always reach out to us if you are interested in getting something. You're not going to pay a premium. You might just wait a little bit longer for special ordering something like that. That goes for any brand we carry, not just Pelican. All right, next question. John J on Facebook said, uh, a few things. Do you guys intend on carrying more Jin Hao pens or just sticking with what you currently carry for the ease of Goulet nib swaps? The 159 I got from you guys is fantastic. I picked up elsewhere a slick 9009 with a hooded nib that writes a decently fine line similar to a Pilot Metropolitan. Would love to see more low cost options in the lineup. Um, yeah, well, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. The reason we started with the pens we did um, is because pens like the X450, the X750, and the 159 had reputations that were really good already. There were a lot of people that already had them, had some reviews and stuff, so um, we knew that there was a pretty decent demand for those. And the fact that they take the number six nib, you can swap them out with the Goulet nibs, it just kind of worked out nicely. That said, there are extremely high order minimums that we have to reach on a per item basis when ordering Jin Hao's. So with that in mind, we have, to, we have to really be confident about a pen being popular before we want to carry it because it's a huge investment for us. So we really started out with a limited scope. We've expanded a couple of colors since the initial um, launching of that brand. Um, as far as expanding to models beyond what we have or color choices beyond what we have, it's, it's such a huge investment that we have to really be sure there's demand for it. I think you're the first one I've ever heard that's asked me specifically about the 9009. So it's something that I can look into, but you know, it's not a slam dunk choice to just like, you know, oh, I'll just pick it up because there's no U.S. distributor for these. I have to buy them direct and get huge quantities of them. So you're probably going to see a limited offering of these pens in the U.S. for that reason from just about any retailer because they're going to be in the same boat that I am. they got to place huge quantities. All right. Okay, you had another question. So another question from John here. Secondly, I think we'd all love a peek into the Goulet warehouse operations. What happens when we submit an online order? Not saying to give away any trade secrets here, but I think we'll all enjoy some behind-the-scenes stuff. I'm sure you would enjoy that. It would be pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. I think what we have going on here is pretty cool. I've been very integral in developing a lot of it. So I think it's pretty neat. Um, however, it is a very homegrown process that we have here. Um, now we're getting into to the point where we're trying to optimize some things. We're getting some consultations and some other people that have been running business at a bigger scale to help us to optimize some things. So that said, there are a lot of trade secrets that we have and I personally have invested a huge amount of time and effort into doing things the way that we do here. So I tend to be a little protective about that stuff. Now I know you're not asking me to give away secrets and all that. I just, uh, I have to be very careful about the way I'd go about that and I haven't been able to invest that kind of time and effort into putting something like that together. It's been on my to-do list though. I have a video list um, of things that have videos that I want to do. Of course, I'm never going to be able to complete my video list because I have so many ideas I can't even execute them all. Um, but this one is definitely one that I would like to do at some point in time and I will make no promises about when I could actually get it done. Um, I, I kind of don't want to get it done yet because honestly we keep changing things and it just gets cooler and more impressive as we go along and as we grow. So I don't know. We'll see. Maybe at some point I'll do that. All right. I am taking my sweet time on these questions. I'm sorry. I'll try to move it along a little bit. Uh, Garth M on Facebook said, Hey Brian, I was wondering if you've heard much about the Visconti Eco Rollers. Any chance Goulet pens will be carrying Visconti in the future? Great question. Um, let me speak about the Eco Rollers first. So for those of you that don't know, the Visconti Eco Roller is a refillable rollerball pen. So it's a rollerball pen that takes fountain pen ink. Um, there's several other pens like that out there. Noodlers has a couple, um, 
who else has it? Monteverde's got it. Um, there's a couple others out there. Um, they're not overwhelmingly popular. Um, there's, they do okay for what they are, but you know, for a lot of people who get into fountain pens, they really get into them and they want the whole fountain pen experience. The refillable roller balls are kind of a compromise. You're getting some of the convenience with a roller ball, but you're not getting the full smoothness and writing experience of a fountain pen. So it's, it's kind of in between. For a lot of people, I think it's not quite enough of the benefits of using a fountain pen to be worth the trouble. So they just tend to stick with roller balls or go all in on fountain pens. Um, so that's okay. And I don't know that much about the eco rollers themselves. I've never actually used one or seen one. Um, I've heard people talk about them. I think they have a pretty decent reputation, except that the, re the replacement tips are pretty expensive, I believe. Um, so they're, they're kind of expensive for what they are, is what I've, I've heard. They're good quality, but they're very expensive. Um, now, to your second question, any chance Goulet pens will carry Visconti in the future? Um, I'm not going to say there's no chance, but I will say there's limited chance because we've reached out to Visconti many times and they have turned us down. Um, they are not interested in us carrying their stuff because we're an online only store. They want brick and mortar. They're a more, I guess, traditional uh, manufacturer and they're interested in kind of that boutique type thing. Now, Granted, a lot of people would argue, and a lot of people who are fans and customers of Goulet would say, yeah, but you guys are online, but you're pretty much like any other brick and mortar in terms of the quality of service and knowledgeable products and relatability and stuff like that. Not to brag on myself, but I really try to do that. That's why um, we got Lamy. That's why we got Pilot being an online-only store. When we started carrying those brands, they were not selling to very many online retailers at all. Um, they were mainly focused on brick and mortar. Um, we have really done a lot of relationship building with those manufacturers in terms of convincing them that we're not just some baseless online company just slashing prices to try to move stuff. Um, and there's a lot of price-related price, price related stuff that goes on in online stuff, and there tends to be kind of this, um, you know, rotating door, I guess, of online retailers because they, they think that being impersonal and slashing prices is the way to get people to buy from your store online. Um, that is not the approach that we've taken at Goulet. So those who do that kind of thing, they don't last very long, So, but they keep on popping up. So there's lots of people who do that. And that frustrates manufacturers and stuff because you don't get a lot of good brand equity um, with those types of sellers. So we look to build relationships and all that. And I think that is what Visconti would benefit from. So I will continue to advocate on behalf of my company, uh, and I would be willing to carry Visconti. So maybe if you are a big Visconti customer, a big advocate, shoot them an email or shoot the, you know, go to Visconti's website and just tell them that, you know, Goulet is a different type of store and you would love to see us carry their stuff. I would do it in a heartbeat if they, uh, well, you know, I haven't built relationships with them yet, but I think the interest is there. I think the way that we sell stuff would be suitable for some of their products, and I think that we would do well with them uh, and represent them well if they would allow us to do so. So not knocking them at all. Um, I do think that they could give us a chance, and that would be cool. But as of right now, that door is not open. So we'll see. Maybe in the future things will change. You never know. All right, next question. Winnie P on Facebook said, have you ever considered some kind of recycling program for your ink files? I can see I have a bunch of empty and thought they must, thought they must cost your company a good amount of money. Okay, so I think what you're talking about is not physically recycling in terms of you know, going to the transfer station or something and, and recycling them there, but you're talking about actually sending them back to us so that we can reuse them here. And that is a good concept, you know, and um, while I won't disclose what any of my costs are or anything like that, um, I have considered this before, um, but it is not economical for me to do that because of the time of coordinating this whole recycling thing, shipping costs, shipping materials, the cost of actually cleaning them out once we get them back and reusing them and possible contamination issues if we weren't to clean them properly or something like that. It just does not make it economical for me to do that. Um, now that said, if you have a lot of vials, you can either reuse them or send them to another eager fountain pen 
fan. Uh, surely they would love to do that. You can repurpose them for some non-fountain pen use, uh, or they are recyclable. So you can, if you don't want to just throw them away, you can recycle them, and they do not end up in a landfill. So you know, that's those are those are the options there. But that is that is a great question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, next, Carissa S on Facebook. I noticed this month's ink drop has pigmented and iron gall inks. That is correct. As a new user of fountain pens, is there anything that I have to look out for when inking up my pens with these inks? And when I flush them out, is there anything special about the cleaning process to take note of with this kind of ink? Well, that is a great question. And we did put a little disclaimer on the ink drop inserts this month. Uh, March of 2014, the theme was lasting impression and it was all permanent inks. And we had, um, you know, a couple, let's see here, off the top of my head, I don't want to misspeak as to what the colors were. So let me pull it up real quick. Um, we had Noodler's Bad Green Gator, um, which is not pigmented or, um, <coughs> or uh, Iron Gall. Noodler's Upper Ganges Blue, which is not either of those as well. They're just regular permanent inks. Um, Platinum Carbon Black is a pigmented one. And then Roar and Cleaner, Salix, and Scabiosa. Those are both Iron Gall inks. However, they're modern formulations of Iron Gall. They're not the same kind of Iron Gall that you would use with a dip calligraphy pen that's going to eat away the metal and stuff like that. I've never heard of there actually being an issue using any of the Roar and Cleaner Iron Galls. And Platinum Carbon Black, you don't want that to ink to dry out completely in your pen because it's kind of hard to clean it out after that happens. Um, just really, honestly, with these inks, regular pen maintenance should be fine. Um, and the two Noodlers ones, those are cellulose reactive permanent inks. So they will become permanent once they bond to the cellulose in the paper, but as far as using them in your pens, you should be fine. I don't think you need to, to be too weary. Now that said, anything you're not comfortable using, don't use it, you know, um, or use it in a pen that you know you're okay with it being in there. If you've got some, you know, classic thing that's irreplaceable, something's particularly sentimental or rare or expensive, you know, maybe save these inks for a different pen than those ones. Next question, Rob P on Facebook. Oh, sorry, wait, before I do that, let me go back. Carissa, your question about the Iron Gall. Go look up Iron Gall on Wikipedia. There's a really good explanation there related to that. Um, that's probably the best place I've seen that explains what Iron Gall actually is. Okay, now, uh, Rob P. on Facebook. You said, any idea if or when the Twisby VAC Mini will be released? I've been eagerly waiting for this pen. Hopefully it's still in the pipeline, thanks. It is still in the pipeline as far as I know. I don't have a specific date though. The dates for a lot of the Twisby stuff gets uh, moved around a lot. So um, they tend to release prototypes and things that are just not even near ready yet um, just to kind of get people excited and it definitely works. Uh, however, I don't have any dates for any of this stuff really. So the VAC Mini, 2014 is kind of all I know. Um, I heard like this summer possibly, but th there's nothing firm on that. So 2014-ish is the best answer I'm able to give you on that one. Heath C on Facebook, you said, are there any production fountain pens with multiple ink options similar to a multi-pen in the ballpoint world? I think it's Edison that has one that's special order that looks like a double-ended lightsaber, but I'm wondering, is there anything available on off the shelf? Um, yeah, Edison, I actually, I wasn't even aware of this pen until a couple of weeks ago. Somebody had emailed me um, about that saying, you know, are there any other pens that have a double edge like that? And I was like, what are you talking about? And I looked it up and I was like, well, I'll be darned, Edison in their signature line, they have a double-ended fountain pen. It's literally like a nib on each side of the pen, which I think is kind of neat, very creative. Creative, cool stuff, you know, Brian. That was Brian Gray. That was pretty cool that you you created that. Um, that said, I've never seen that from any other company. There's no company that I'm aware of that has a uh, like multi pen. I'm thinking like the old style click pen that has like the blue and the red and the green tab, and you would just kind of click through. Uh, there's nothing that I know that has anything like that. And as far as a fountain pen, there's just too much to a fountain pen and the way that it works to be able to have all of that in one pen. The thing would end up being like this big around if you had that multi pen and a fountain pen. Maybe some people would like that. I don't know. I'll talk to Brian Gray and see if he wants to develop that. Uh, but uh, no, as far as I know, there's nothing really else that's out there. I would say there's probably some pen out there. There was a fountain pen on one pen and on one end and maybe a ballpoint on the other. But the Edison, that double-ended thing is the only pen I've ever seen that has 
two fountain pen nibs in one pen. I think it's pretty neat, but um, I'm not. A, there might be somebody else out there that has that, but that's all I know. Carmen C on Facebook, you asked, how does the original Crown Mill Classic laid paper compare to the Gilolo Verge de France paper? Excuse me for butchering that French. I took three years of it in high school. That's been a while. Um, okay, so they're virtually identical. Um, aside from the watermarks and maybe some color offerings uh, that might be slightly different between the two brands, they're very similar, almost identical paper. Um, similar kind of laid, laid paper. Um, you know, it's got kind of a bumpy raised kind of uh, thing to it. Uh, and so they're, you know, that's, that's about it. You know, they're basically, basically identical. So if you like one, you're gonna like the other pretty much um, as far as ink performance and the way they feel when you write and stuff like that. Pretty much identical. Uh, Gordon C on Facebook, the Quaco Sport Ice or Classic. Um, the FP Geeks review of this pen now begins with an update that warns against using it as an eyedropper because ink seeps because ink seeps between the section and the cylindrical plastic that houses the nib and feed, um, which apparently looks unsightly and is very difficult to clean out. Do you see this as a concern, or is there a way of avoiding it? Thanks in advance. Uh, yeah, so basically what's happening is there's a nib and a feed that's inside this nib housing. That's not uncommon for fountain pens to have that kind of arrangement. That housing fits into the grip of the pen. So what, what they're talking about is on those pens, which some of them um, have a translucent grip on the pen and you can see that ink is coming on the outside of the nib housing and getting around in between the nib housing and the grip and it can look a little un aesthetically unpleasing I guess. Um, personally I don't really care honestly for me um, I know some people really get bothered by nib creep and get bothered by ink, you know, being in places that they don't think it should be, you know, like ink little drips inside the cap of a demonstrator pen and stuff like that. That really bothers some people, and I get it, you know. Uh, personally, I don't really care that much with this pen. Um, the the Kueco Sports are, are pretty utilitarian pens, you know, I wouldn't really take it to a fancy business meeting to try to impress anybody or anything. So I don't really get bothered by a little bit of aesthetics of ink being in places. You know, my business's logo is literally an ink splatter. So I kind of embrace the inky nature of fountain pens personally. I don't view it as a status thing where you need to, you know, have this very clean kind of polished professional look. I, that, I'm much more of a utilitarian kind of guy when it comes to fountain pens. I just love to play with the ink and do cool stuff with the pens. Um, so for me, it's not really a problem, but that's really just going to be a personal preference. Some people it's going to drive them crazy. Other people, you know, whatever. I don't feel the need to put like a big disclaimer kind of thing on it, but, and I haven't had that happen on every Kueco pen either. So it could just be that, you know, the pens that they've experienced have been, you know, particularly bothersome to them and they felt the need to put that on there, which is, you know, totally their prerogative. Uh, Carmen C on Facebook, you asked, uh, do you have any idea why the US and European paper sizes are different? Well, I don't know why the US and European sizes of anything are different. Honestly, there's historical reasons, I'm sure, but I have no idea why the US sizes are the way they are. Uh, honestly, I find it kind of annoying. 12 inches and a foot and, you know, three feet in a yard and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of bizarre and I, you know, it would be kind of nice to have one system, honestly, but it is what it is, you know. Um, the best thing, best resource, I guess, that I can point you to, I can't, I honestly can't explain it because it's so bizarre and convoluted. Um, go to Wikipedia and just type in paper size and you'll see an explanation of all the different sizes of paper and what they all mean and they've got all kinds of history in there and stuff that I can't even begin to explain. So that's the best resource for you to learn more about that. Adam T on Facebook, you asked, do you have any tips on how to get pens that don't fully disassemble to dry out more quickly after a cleaning so that you can refill them sooner without diluting your ink? Uh, yes, I know exactly how to do that. I do that on a lot of my videos um, and it's a tip I'm happy to share. It's something I discovered a long time ago that has worked out great. Um, so basically, say you've got you know a piston filling pen where the nib doesn't come out and you know that you've got a bunch of water that's left in your pen after you've cleaned it. If you go and ink that thing right up, you're going to base essentially the water that's left in the pen, specifically in the feed, that's where most of that water gets trapped up. 
um, that is going to mix with whatever ink you have and it could dilute it to the point where you visually notice a difference, especially when you first start writing. Or where it's really worse, um, this is where more people notice it even more, um, is when you have a cartridge converter pen and you are cleaning the pen out and then you go to change out the cartridge or take a converter that you've filled with ink separately, put it on the pen and you've got a bunch of water left in the feed of your pen and then you're putting the ink kind of behind that and you start writing with it, you've got mostly water up at the front. It's going to look way different and you're thinking like, what is wrong with my pen? And you write with it for a while and you're like, it's not getting any better. Well, you need to write with it for like a good half a page to do that before that ink has pushed all that water out and you're starting to get just ink all the way through it. So what, you, what, what you're really trying to do here, the goal, is to get it to the point where you have cleaned the pen and you are actually getting most of that water out of the pen. You don't have to get every last little drop and drive yourself crazy because if there's a couple little drips left here and there on the inside of the body of the pen, you don't have to worry about that. It's not going to be enough to make a significant difference. But what you do want to do is get the water out of the feed. And the way that you do that is just with a handy dandy paper towel or napkin or some kind of cloth material that you just touch to the nib. Um, on the top of the nib works best, not to the very tip, but the top of the nib will work best because the slit on that nib will uh, touch right up to that cloth, it'll wick out the water, because water flows through a pen with capillary action. It'll wick all of that water out of the feed and it'll essentially dry the pen out mostly. Not bone dry, but you know, water, fountain pen ink is mostly water anyway. So a little couple of drips in your pen is not gonna do, not gonna cause any effect. But if you just do that little napkin paper towel trick, uh, I like paper towels personally, but if you, if you do that little paper towel trick, man, you're good to go. You don't have to worry about it after that. And it takes about 10 seconds to get that out of there. It really works well. So do that and you'll be okay, Adam. All right, Carl B on Facebook. <clears throat> Not technically pen related, but how many different Goulet pen bookmarks do you guys currently have in the office for outgoing orders? Uh, for example, I got three so far, two with a Benjamin Franklin quote, and one with just right on, Ink Nouveau. Um, yeah, right now, well, we, let, me, let me say, we've done the bookmark thing pretty much from the very beginning. Um, I don't know why, I just, it's an idea that I had in my head from the very beginning and, you know, they're fairly, um, you, you know, I, I, they're a little marketing piece, they're shareable, they're also useful, you know, you can stick it in your, your book and keep it around. So I thought it was just, just something cool to do and we've just kept it up over the last four and a half years. Um, so we, we, we just had one bookmark for a long time. like the first three and a half years that we were here is all one bookmark. And I was finally thinking like, geez, you know, we've got customers that have been with us kind of from the beginning. They're probably getting pretty sick of having the same bookmark over and over again. So we decided to mix it up a little bit. We now have four different bookmarks. Um, I have three of them here. The one that says right on, I actually don't have on me. I think we may be low on those or they might be stored somewhere. I wasn't able to get to it quickly. Um, but we do have several other ones. The, you, see, you mentioned you have the Ben Franklin one. That one I like. Um, it says either write something worth reading or do something worth writing. That's a cool quote that Tyler, our awesomeographer, videographer, photographer guy, he, um, he discovered that quote, so that was kind of cool. Um, another one that we have is this cool uh, quote from Ellen Johnson Sirleaf that says, if your dreams don't scare you, they aren't big enough. Very fitting for the way we've gone about growing Goulet here. And then lastly, one of my favorites uh, is a Thomas Jefferson quote that says, I'm a great believer in luck and I find the harder I work, the more I have of it. I just love that quote. Um, Thomas Jefferson, his uh, Monticello is not very far from where we are here in Richmond, Virginia. So I went to Monticello a bunch of times as a kid. In fact, Drew, our shipping manager, he and I went on the same field trip in third grade to Monticello. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's little hometown, her little little estate there. So that's kind of neat, neat little background there. So I could see doing more of these things in the future. I, I've always wanted to do more. I just, you know, it's a matter of, you know, how do I spend my time? And we've already got a bunch of bookmarks, so we'll come out with some more in the future. If you got any cool quotes or ideas or stuff, just just shoot them, shoot and shoot them my way, and maybe we'll maybe we'll throw it on there. All right, keep on trucking here. We got a few more questions. Um, Let's see here, when I turn my, okay, sorry, at Willia4 on Twitter. Uh, when I turn my Monteverde and Vincia over and look at the underside of the nib, the feed, I see a large number of ridges. Same with my Nemesine Singularity. If I look at my Schaefer 100, it has just a few ridges. When I look at my Lamy Safari, it doesn't have any. 
Are these ridges functional or decorative? If functional, what do they do? When selecting my next pen purchase, should this be one of my criteria? Okay, so what you're talking about is um, I've got a Monteverde Regatta Sport here, and it's the uh, same nib and feed setup as what you have on your Invincia. Um, what you're talking about is the feed. Um, on the underside of the nib here, that's the feed, and that is the vehicle that draws ink from the ink reservoir to the nib. Um, and these ridges that you're talking about, those are typically called fins. Um, and some nibs have them and sub nibs don't. Some have very fat ones, some have very skinny ones. Some have a lot, some have a few. Uh, it really depends on the design of the pen and the way that this thing functions. It's all about air ink interchange, okay? So you have a body of ink inside the pen, a reservoir of some kind, and you have a nib that is drawing the ink out of the pen. The feed and the nib, they work together to draw the ink out of the ink reservoir. Well, if you know anything about capillary action, you know, think about like if you have a cup with a straw and water or some kind of liquid in it. Um, if you put your finger over the straw and lift it up, the liquid stays in the straw. And then when you let it go, it drops out because there needs to be an exchange of air. Otherwise, you're just the, the capillary action of the water will keep that water up in there. It's the same thing with a pen. If this thing was completely sealed up and all you had was one little slit in the, in the um, feed, the ink would not come out of the pen. There needs to be air to go up in to exchange the ink that's being removed from the ink reservoir. That's how you get the flow. And that all comes down to engineering that is beyond my understanding. So there are people whose job is to engineer pens and things like that so that you're getting a proper exchange of air that goes into the pen as ink is flowing out. And that will help to determine the flow of ink. And that is part of why some pens just naturally like write wetter than other ones. And that also is why some inks write wetter and drier in other ones because the viscosity of the ink has an impact on how quickly the air exchanges with it and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of different factors and that's part of both what makes you beat your head against the wall with these pens and why they're so much fun to mess around with is because it is such a varying experience. Um, so that said, that is essentially what is happening with uh, this whole nib feed kind of setup like that. Um, but when it comes to the fins and stuff like that, the fins here act kind of like a regulator. So ink is filling up into these fins in varying degrees so that when you're writing, it's got a little bit of extra ink to pull from if it's not drawing fast enough from the reservoir itself. It all comes down to how the pen is designed. Every pen is different. Every pen has kind of a different setup, but that's what's going on. It should not, that alone should not be a factor for you in what pen you're shopping for, unless you just aesthetically like one type over another. Um, I know I know a bunch of people who particularly like kind of that clean, non-thin, kind of swoopy feed look like you have on the Lamy or the Pilot, some of the Pilot pens. Um, you know, that's really just kind of up to you. It's really a preference thing. But it, it's not particularly good or bad if a pen has it or doesn't. It all comes down to how is the thing designed overall. All right, Kevin M. In an email, you asked me, I have heard that Pelican will be selling Edelstein ink in cartridge form shortly. Have you heard anything specific? Well, that would be news to me. I've never heard that. So I don't know what your source is. It's possible that, you know, they may be doing that. I think that it would be a little unlikely because um, typically with Pen, with pen companies that have higher end inks like that, like example, Pilot. You know, they have their regular line of Pilot inks and uh, Miki inks that they actually don't even really distribute those in the US, but they have those in cartridge form. They do not have the, um, the, the Pilot Iroshizuku inks in cartridge form, only in bottles. Um, that's how it's been for Pelican Edelstein ever since they came out a couple years ago. Um, they have the regular Pelican inks in their ink cartridge form, but not the Edelsteins. I'm not going to say that they couldn't or wouldn't put them in cartridge form. I'd be a little surprised if they did because I think they'd be pretty expensive and I don't know that that's something in high demand. I personally, you know, at Goulet here, we don't do much in the way of cartridges at all. If you look on our site, you'll see cartridges for some pens, especially some of the proprietary ones where, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to get cartridges for them elsewhere. Uh, we really don't 
other than those, we really don't do a lot with cartridges. We're all about bottles here. We like ink color choices and stuff. We, we carry all of, as, as many bottles as we can, but the cartridges themselves, just we don't, we don't particularly do a lot with cartridges. So I don't know if they do come out with them, I don't even think that I would carry them probably, but it's, it's, it's always possible. I don't know everything there is to know about these products. Okay. Scott B. on Facebook. Just a couple more questions here and then we'll be done. Uh, Scott B. on Facebook. Uh, two questions. I know one day you may do a Q&A on Twisby. It's possible. Uh, but I must know, is it possible to flood the feed with ink by turning the mechanism on the Twisby VAC 700 without breaking the seal and making an inky mess? I find this act convenient when the nib becomes a little dry. Excuse me. This works perfectly with my piston filling 580 and other um, converter filling pens, but will it work for a vac filler? Um, you got some more questions, but I'll address that first. Um, no, the, vac, the vacuum pen works differently. Just turning the knob doesn't do anything. All the knob does on that pen is holds the mechanism down on the back. The mechanism is a plunger, so it just slides up and down. Um, so just turning the knob doesn't do diddly anything. So you got to undo the knob and then pull it out a little bit to actually break that seal. And then even then, you're not actually forcing any ink down into it until the O-ring is actually engaged on the walls of the inside of that pen, which doesn't happen until you pull that thing up about half an inch. Uh, and then if you pull it up too far, it's really easy to, to get it up too far. And when you go to push it down, you're forcing way more ink than you want, and you're going to blurt it out of your pen. So that pen in particular is one of the harder ones to kind of force some ink through. It can be done. I do it all the time myself uh, when I feel like I want to, you know, kind of force more ink in there. Uh, but I would say that you um, will want to be careful when doing that because it's easy to, to, do, to overdo it. Um, now that said, if you are not unscrewing the, the knob and pulling out the plunger just a tad to break that seal, that alone could be the issue with your pen writing a little drier. I've got a couple videos on, on that um, related specifically to the VAC 700 and the Pilot Custom 823, which is a similar kind of vacuum setup. Uh, and, and you can check those out as well. Go to, you know, go to, to YouTube and, and check out those ones I've done. Um, but that, just doing that act might help you out with that specific pen. Okay, <clears throat> now to the second part of your question, Scott. Uh, my last question is a little off topic, but since this is an open forum, of course, uh, what diet program, or should I say lifestyle choice, have you made for losing all the weight you've lost? I've been thinking about getting in better shape myself, and I've been reading some books on doing so. What is your secret? <laughs> Uh, well, it's not a secret at all. I actually did a video on this. Um, I did a couple of videos. I did one called 30 by 30 by 30, which talked about my initial goal is I wanted to lose 30 pounds uh, by my 30th birthday, which is on April 30th. So 30 by 30 by 30. I thought it was a, had a neat ring to it. Um, at that time, I weighed about 245 pounds, and I wanted to get down to 215, which is about my college you know, fighting weight. Um, I didn't actually fight, but you know what I mean. That's the phrase. Uh, back down to my college weight. And so um, I set that goal for myself, and I actually achieved it and blew it out of the water, um, hovering right now around 195. So the way that I did it, um, did a couple of things. And they're, they're really secret, you know. I'm really going to tell you something you haven't heard before. Um, it was eating better and eating less food and exercising. Those are pretty much my two big secrets. I don't mean to sound, you know, like a, like a jerk or anything, but that's basically what you need to do. I was eating a lot of junk, and I was eating way too much food, just way, just in general, just taking in way more than I needed to. Um, that said, I am definitely a quantity over quality kind of eater. So for me personally, what worked really well was calorie counting, okay? I know that's not a method that works well for most people, but it worked great for me. So I use an app that's called MyFitnessPal, it's on my phone. I still use it to this day, 215 days or whatever into my program. I'm still using it. Um, even though I've lost all the weight and more than I wanted to, I still use it because it's kind of like a little accountability partner for me. 
you. The app itself is easy to use, and there's lots of other good ones out there similar to it um, that I've heard other people like as well. But the cool thing about the app is it's easy to enter it in. It's got a little barcode thing on the phone so I can scan foods as I'm eating them. And what it really taught me was to look at portions. And uh, you know, it's got a lot of restaurants in there with different meals. And I realized that you know when I went to um, some of my favorite you know, steak houses or whatever, and I would eat three or four rolls before I'd have my meal, I might be taking in six or 800 calories of bread before I ate my meal. And you know, when you're trying to lose weight, you can't consume 2,000 calories in a meal. You know, that might be all the calories you can eat for the day. So once I actually started realizing how much food I was eating, I kind of really got amazed. You know, when I would go to a Mexican restaurant, you know, they give you the, the corn tortilla chips with the salsa before you get your meal, you can easily suck down six or 800 calories of chips before you even get your meal. And then your meal is, just probably terrible for you as well. Mexican places are n not always the best, especially the Tex-Mex type places. So you really gotta be careful eating burgers and stuff with mayonnaise on them. Restaurants, if you get a burger in a, in a restaurant, the mayonnaise alone is like 200 calories. So you gotta just be a little bit smarter about what you're doing. And then you can get into, okay, I know I'm consuming way too much food here. And you start to look and you're like, Oh my gosh, if I eat this cup of ice cream, which by the way, a cup of what the ice cream that I used to eat was actually about three or four servings, which is probably 700 calories in a cup. Not a physical cup, but a cup like I would do, a big coffee mug. Um, so I'd easily eat seven or 800 calories of ice cream, you know, because I, because I worked out that day and burned 200 calories, I'd eat 800 calories of ice cream, yeah. So I was just getting a little smarter about that. So what I did, I didn't wanna eat less necessarily, so I just decided to eat food that was more bang for your buck. So things like apples, I eat apples like crazy, you know, bananas, celery, lots of vegetables and fruits and stuff like that. Um, some, some soy products and stuff like that. Now I make lunch, I make salads for lunches every day. As I started eating better, my body started actually craving more natural foods and vegetables and that kind of stuff. So I haven't gone like way overboard, like everything must be organic and all this kind of stuff. I, I'm getting into some of that stuff, but I eat, I eat a lot more salmon now instead of just hamburgers and stuff like that. So just really being a little bit smarter about that. And then exercising, um, I wake up at five o'clock in the morning and I bike about 20 or 25 miles pretty much every day. Now I'm, I am kind of an avid cyclist now. That's, that's how I did it. I found something that I really love doing and that was cycling. So, uh, you know, some people it might be running, some people it might be, you know, Zumba or something like, it might be something completely different for you. You gotta find what you really enjoy doing because doing something that you really love will help you to um, get your butt out of bed and go do something. For me personally, I got two kids, I got this business. My day is insane once it actually starts. And at the end of the day, I just don't have any energy. So for me, the only solution was to wake up early. I started out waking up at 6.30 and exercising and that wasn't enough time. I would start waking up at six and then 5.45, 5.30. Now, you know, my work day usually starts about 8.30, but I gotta get my kids ready and all that kind of stuff. Um, that takes a while, you know, it takes me at least an hour to get the kids ready in the morning. So if I wanna get a good workout in, you know, do my devotionals and do, a, do you know, kind of get myself ready for the day, I gotta wake up at five o'clock and it's not fun. I hate waking up early. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Uh, but I get my butt out of bed every day. I don't hate it as much anymore as, as I used to, but you know, man, when you're, when you hit that alarm at five o'clock and it's like 20 degrees outside and it's dark and you work out and it's still dark, <laughs> it can be a little rough, but I love it now and I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, that said, I did summarize a lot of this stuff in a video where I kind of really put together a kind of a comprehensive, like, wow, this is how I actually did all this. So if you want a little bit of a plan, try this. Um, I did a video called Accomplish Your Goals with Bliss. Bliss is an acronym that I came up with that talks about basically the different components of what I found to be successful for me in my weight loss and kind of life regimen um, that you should definitely check out. But the bottom line is there are no secrets, there are no miracles, there are no pills. You basically just have to fess up and do the work. That's what you need to do. Last question. 
I know this has been a long Q&A, and thanks for hanging in there. But the last question, uh, Logan V on Facebook said, I'm looking for a good workhorse pen that I can use at my office. It needs to be able to take some abuse, but also look nicer than the Pilot Varsity disposables that I've been using, which are great pens, by the way. Great pens. Um, also able to use with noodlers or other bulletproof type inks would be great. Okay, so the Varsity is cool, but it's a, basically a disposable pen. So you use the ink that's in it, and you toss it. That's the idea. Now you can break those things apart and refill them. It's not the easiest thing to do and if you're changing color drastically it's tough and it's got kind of a cheap wick feed in there so if you're using like the Noodler's Bulletproof stuff it may not work as great in those cheap feeds. Um, but that said um, I have a video called Fountain Pen 101 uh, student pens where I talk about some of my favorites. Um, the Pilot Metropolitan is a great option for you. That's a great workhorse pen, 15 bucks. You know, it's a more of an investment than a Varsity, but it's more of a pen than a Varsity. Um, Jin Hao's got some great pens. That, the Jin Hao, you know, the X450, 750, and the 159, those I actually didn't have in that Fountain Pen 101 video because I didn't have those pens back then. Um, so I talked about like the Metropolitan and the Safari and some other ones, uh, the Platinum Preppy, I think. And so, you know, there are some great pens out there for options for you. Basically, just take pens and look at anything in the you know, I would say $30 or under, you know, and those will, those will be a pretty good um, option for you for kind of workhorse pens. Most of those are pretty much workhorse pens. So there you have it. That was another Q&A under the belt. So, um, you know, I appreciate you sticking with me. Thanks for hanging in there and bearing with me as I'm kind of slowing down my videos just for a couple weeks here, but you know, they'll be back. Um, so uh, next week, I'm gonna be back, back to a theme, open forum this week. Next week um, is gonna be March 21st of 2014, and I'm going to do a Noodlers week. Now, I usually get a lot of Noodlers questions anyway, so I'm not anticipating it's going to be hard for me to get questions between the 130 plus inks that they have currently available and all of the different pens and the flex pens and all these different things. I'm willing to bet I'm going to get a lot of questions on Noodlers. So that said, um, I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that I think will benefit the most people possible. Um, there are some really specific questions I get regarding Noodlers that I may or may not be able to address, and we'll just have to see how it goes. I'll have to see what comes in. Um, so that said, any questions you have, just bring it on. I know a lot about Noodlers, got a lot of good resources, um, and I'm happy to answer anything I can about the brand. So um, that said, any questions about their inks, their pens, any of that stuff, go for it. Um, you can ask me on the comments on YouTube, on Ink Nouveau, uh, the blog. You can email gouletqa at gouletpens.com. You can answer, ask on Twitter at hashtag gouletqa, or just hit us up at gouletpens.com, answer, um, you know, ask the question there, uh, or we'll do a Facebook post. If you notice today, most of our questions came from Facebook. I've noticed most of the questions keep coming from Facebook. We'll get questions here and there on the blog and YouTube and, and uh, Twitter and stuff, but a lot of these come from Facebook. So got a lot of curious folks on Facebook asking me questions, I guess, which is totally cool. So as long as I get good questions and as long as I, you know, keep getting views on these videos, I'll keep putting them out. So uh, cool stuff, man. I'm, I'm happy to be back and, and doing some of this stuff again. Um, if you have any questions, you know, you know how to reach me. Um, I hope you have a great weekend, great rest of your week. Thanks so much for spending time with me. And as always, be sure that you are always going to write on.